And my guest today is the Minister of Information, Publicity and Broadcasting Services, Monica Mchangwa, who is arguably one of the most influential women in the country if her portfolio is anything to go by. I mean, the Minister of Information is no joke. Thank you so much, Ms. Mchangwa, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Thank you for having me. And I want to say to audience, I am very, very thankful that I've been invited to this very important program. It is very important yes. as we celebrate Women's Month. Yes. So Mr. Changwa, I always want to ask my guests this question before I start, just to understand how much value they put into their work and what they do and what they have been assigned to do. So how would you rate your performance as the Minister of Information, say from a scale of 1 to 10 since you were appointed in 2018? Well, it's very difficult to rate yourself, but uh, let me say for anything which I'm assigned to do, starting when I was a very little girl, when my mother assigned me to go and work in the fields, I would do it more than 100%. I, I, I want to get results. I'm result oriented. I want things done properly. I'm a perfectionist. So I really put a lot of pressure on myself to make sure that whatever assignment I'm given, I do it well. And you mentioned that you are, uh, you, I'm glad you talked about how you were political because we understand that you joined the liberation struggle at a very young age, 15 if I'm correct, yes, yes. and you recently turned 60. Yes. So if my math is right, that's about 45 years yes. serving the country, right. the liberation struggle as a politician. How was the journey? Tell us about your journey, the highlights, the challenges. Let me start off by saying I was brought up by a mother who was uh, very, uh, I'm blessed actually, she was very, very, uh, how would I say it, gifted. She was a gifted woman. I still have a lot of uh, things which I do today out of that influen influential mother. Humble beginnings, we didn't have much when I was growing up. In fact, if there's anything, I lost my father when I was in grade six, I was just about 11 years. And you, you know what it was like in Rhodesia. Uh, where, yes, my father was working, he was a policeman, uh, but when he died, that meant uh, we had to survive on a very meager pension. And so my mother had to do everything to make us work hard to achieve what she wanted us to achieve. My mother, uh, she did put a lot of importance on education. Right. And we were brought that explains your two we, degrees. We, yeah, <laughs> we, we were brought up to appreciate what other people do for you. Absolutely. And also to love family, to love each other. We are a close-knit family because of my, my mother. My father, I lost my father, as I said, at the age of 11. So I grew up with that woman. She had a way to instill all the good values you can think about, which kept me going even when I joined the struggle. As you have rightly said, I joined the struggle when I was hardly 15. Mm -hmm. I was just doing Form 3 at uh, Mutambara High School. And when I left, it meant that I was on my own. I had no sister to look up to, no I had no brother, no mom, but I tell you, that book which my mother had inscripted in my memory kept me going. Every day in those five years when I was in the bush, I would open it and say, my mother would never want me to do whatever, even if it's peer pressure, whatever it is, I would quickly tell myself, no, 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 this is not what my mother would expect me to do. So she was uh, heavy duty, strong. She really uh, brought us up with lots of love. Mm -hmm. I remember there was never a single day which we grew up in our own home without relatives. She loved relatives. She looked after poor children, other poor children, because during in Rhodesia, just to have a father who was a policeman, it, it meant that we were better roof than many other families. Uh, so. But, uh, but we obviously had to work very hard. Mm -hmm. I'm that person who used to go to the garden, to water the garden, to make sure that you plant whatever vegetables you need for the household before going to school. And that wow. I started as a very little girl. Mm -hmm. But I would like to know your thought process, Minister Mutranga, because right now, as a country, to get young people to vote, statistics have shown that young people are not very active in politics there you are, a 15-year-old, and you decide to join the liberation struggle. I'd like to understand your thought process. Like, what is it that you were thinking as a young girl, age 15, and you say, you know what, I am joining the struggle, 
I'm going to the boat. Growing up in Rhodesia itself was a challenge. Uh, you didn't look up to anything, to do anything as you go to school. It didn't matter how brilliant and bright you were. There were only two special professions which you look up to. That's nursing, especially for a woman, nursing or teacher. And I must say, uh, growing up during those days, you, there was no opportunity for a black person. Mm -hmm. First of all, you didn't even have a, a, a chance to vote for who should be running your country. Just because we're We're not color. completely as black people. We had nothing to do with those people who went into parliament. The very little minority uh, white community in this country were the only ones who would uh, vote for who would go into parliament or who would run towns or, or anything for that matter. So really, as we went, as I went to Mutambara Secondary School, it was at Mutambara Secondary School that uh, we learned a lot about the politics of this country. And I must uh, speak about uh, the church, the Methodist church. Mutambara High School is a Methodist school. And uh, the bishop there at that time was Tendekai Bishop Ebom Zorewa. And uh, he spoke openly about politics. He spoke about why would a black man be afraid to fight for what is rightfully yours. I mean, thanks to Mozambique and uh, Angola, they had achieved their independence. So it was a question of looking back and say, what is that we are afraid of as young generation right. to go and fight for what is rightfully ours? And that was, uh, that took a lot of young boys and girls from my school. One professor even left, in 1975, a lot of children left Mutambara High School for the struggle, and a lot of other children from the Eastern Board especially. So it, that was the spirit. I call it the Samora Michelle generation spirit. You know, the, the attainment of independence in Mozambique inspired us a lot as young people. Yeah. And we knew there was a newspaper which Smith used to run, which would say, never in a thousand years, a black man will never be able to rule this country. And we, you know, things which young generation of today may not know that uh, in this country, there were certain areas where black people were not even allowed to move. All these suburbs, suburbs where we uh, have uh, brought up our kids, they didn't know that before independence, it was a no-go area. Mm -hmm. And those areas, you needed a sort of a passport to move around in Highlands, to move around in Borodel, uh, let alone uh, in First Street in, in the, in the Araris, in this uh, Salisbury city. So these are things which we asked ourselves as a young generation. At 15. At 15, yes. And to say, we can actually do it. If they've done it in, 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 in Angola, we can also right. do it. If they've done it, Frelimo had just attained independence in Mozambique. And everybody was saying, well, if they've done it, they are so brave. What is that which we can't do for ourselves? What kept me going in those uh, five days, five years in the bush, the love of my country, right. the love of opportunities. And when we left from Tambara, I didn't know what was ZANU PF, what was ZANU or any party, political party for that matter. I was actually going to we went out just to say we need opportunities. As black people of this right. country, we also want to be lawyers, we want to be business people, we want to be, you know, we want to do uh, pilots. We wanted to do all sorts of careers. As we were going to school, I was a smart girl. I had come up with four points at grade seven and uh, I was doing very well and a lot more other children who are doing very well we left we left just as four girls it was a lot of determination yeah. to say and like I say it's a spirit that spirit to say which took away the fear as a young 15 and uh, when I left I left with a group of uh, the same age so fast forward like you wanted to do fast forward after the struggle you um, now a politician I suppose yeah. and you are a woman and this mm. is a male dominated sector if I could call it right how have you been encountering any specific challenges as a woman working in a male dominated space first of all let me say I, I have read a lot of history and I have a lot of women who were there before us who I have a lot of admiration the Zimbabwean women uh, didn't start at the at going to war at the, at the Chimurenga three no there were women of this country were always in the forefront. When you look at Mbiyane Hunter, you know, the statue which is going to be put right in the center of Harare uh, City, that is a woman whose place was just not in the kitchen, but she was actually a war strategist. There are women who I adore and admire and who inspired me so much, like Winnie Mandela. I mean, women who gave up everything, who were, who were so brave, 
no had no, no no fear of any sort who fought not for just for themselves right. but for the for the better good of everybody so i have always looked at women as capable women as capable human beings mm -hmm. i normally don't look at uh, gender when i'm looking at capability right it's, but that is you but our yeah. society does look at that Yes, I know that we grew. That, that this is why I have been heavily involved. I have uh, worked so hard in the in empower in the empowerment of women in this country and in the region and even uh, at global level because I understand we need to support each other as women. Women need to pick each other up, pick pieces for those women who are not as confident, who needs to be inspired. This is what I've always been doing in my life. I like to talk to young people to inspire them that where I am is very easy. When I move around in my constituency, I talk to young girls in schools where I sometimes provide sanitary pads and I tell them, look, you are lucky you are coming to school with, with shoes. This was never an opportunity which I had as a little girl. I mean, there are many good things which are happening to the young children of this country today. But unfortunately, if it's not said to these young people, they always feel they are old somehow. They feel they, that they are entitled to, you know. It's very important that we continue to inspire young girls to say, look, you can actually do it. I came from there. There is nothing special with Monica Mchangwa. I'm, I'm from a humble beginning. I just had to put a lot of effort. All it takes is working hard. Put a lot of effort in whatever you do. Respect for other people. Listen carefully from other people. There's a lot. You cannot be born knowing everything. I do not know everything. What I've, what I've benefited from is to listen from other women, mm -hmm. especially those who have come before me. There are women who I've always read about and listened to whatever they say because they inspire me. And uh, there is no woman I have met who have nothing special for me to learn. Even as I move around in my constituency, I listen to these elderly women, and there's a lot I learn from them. And then when I move around with young people of today, as I bring up my own children, there's a lot I learn from my children. Are you one of those women who believe to be a superwoman, or you are happy to call in some help? I'm always happy to have some help. In fact, I'm where I am because I, I enjoy a lot of support from my husband. I'm blessed. I think when I was growing up, my mother used to say, pray so that you get a good uh, partner. Oh, yeah, you need to pray to have a good partner. It was, uh, I, I am very grateful. God gave me a very, very understanding husband, very supportive in whatever I do. And whatever is my success, it's my husband's success. Right. His success is mine and it has been like that all the way that's why it has been very easy for us to bring up our family we have four lovely boys yes i am a disciplinary i have to admit you know my husband has left all the disciplining of the children to me and i'm with four boys is four, four boys will always be boys and i've always you been be i had to be firm with a lot of love I, I, I also give them opportunity to explain the, their thinking in whatever they are doing. Uh, so before I even condemn them for whatever they would have done wrong, I try to understand why they did, the, they did whatever they did. Uh, I, I, I really also understand that we are growing up in different circumstances, different from the, when I was growing up. When I was growing up, it was like a mother who called children, whether it's for food, whether it's for going to the fields, whether no it's, uh, there was absolutely, they didn't have much time for that because they were, you know, survival of the fittest. You had to work hard to make sure that, at least to even be able to send your children to school in those days, it was a big, big success. Yeah. Uh, but today, it's different. I have four boys. I relate to them individually. The way I relate to Nevo is not the way I relate to Tendai. It's not the way I relate to Tawan. Neither is the same way I relate to Tino. So I, I, I'm now beginning to deal with my children in a different manner in terms of understanding the circumstances in which they are. It's equally the same when we're growing up. Mom will say, I want you to be a nurse. Because for them, they were looking at us as insurance, as children as insurance. If you send your children to school, then they will look after you. And naturally, that's true. Right. 
Right. That way, we were the insurance of our parents. So that's why we, I, we took a, a, a great uh, burden. Of, it's not a burden as such, mm -hmm. but I loved it. I looked after my mom, the responsibility. I looked after my, not only did I look after my mom, I looked after the whole siblings, siblings' children, and uh, my mother's sister's children. And uh, for me, that gave me a lot of satisfaction because that's mm -hmm. what she brought me up to be. So in a way, that takes a lot out of you. Let's be honest, we are all human beings. Yeah. But at the same time, it gives you a lot of satisfaction. You sit back and watch people who have passed through your hands, you know, successfully, and the you are the fruits of your labor. And I always say, like they say in the Bible, I say, thank you, Lord, for giving me a golden hand. At least I managed to bring uh, several people up there mm -hmm. to start a new life. And the good thing about it is when I do it, I do it for those people, not for myself. Yeah. So I, it's, it's a very, very good feeling, I must say. And I thank my mother for that, for that love. Mm -hmm. I look at my mother's sister's children as my own sisters and brothers. I never made a discrimination. Right. Up to now, even well, well after my mother is gone, my mother has gone 19 years. And I look back and I say, thank you, mom, because whatever she instilled in me, it's written clearly on the wall for everybody to emulate, and I am so grateful. So she's the power behind me, my mother. But earlier on, you spoke about how even if you're working so hard, people will always have something to yeah. say. And especially now that yeah. you are in a position of authority, yes. you, it comes with a lot of criticism, mm -hmm. a lot of backlash. I'll give an example. When you hosted your 60th birthday party, mm -hmm. that was a controversial uh, party. People calling it a super spreader, and uh, a lot of accusations that came from it. How do you handle such backlash, such criticism uh, when you are in this position? Let me st say, uh, where people don't like to talk about mediocre, and they talk about some, some person who has got some value in one way or the other. And when you are a leader, that's expected. It's unfortunate with social media, you find a lot of the people just sit in every corner, wherever they are, they put anything which destroys families. And this is what I keep telling the young girls out there, even a lot of women, that you need to just set your mind and say, this is what I'm going to do. I am a politician, I want, I'm serving my country, I'm doing this because I believe what I'm doing is right for my country. This is what you should focus on. If you are going to spend a lot of time focusing on those uh, negative things which brings you down, right. then you will never be able to go forward. It is important to listen to people. There is what is constructive criticism. That's fine. When people talk and this constructive criticism, you learn do, one do or two things. Oh though, yeah, you learn, you learn one or two things. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm a very good listener. And I always take very good things. And I want to tell you again, that comes again from my mother. Because my mother says, listen to everybody, but move around with yourself. Mm -hmm. So whatever people say, don't say, I don't want to hear this one. Mm -hmm. Just allow people to say what they're thinking, and you put it in a self, and you save, you know, a sieve, yes. sieve. You know, and you sieve out what you don't need, and you keep what is good for you. What will make you continue as to go leader, forward? Is there ever a point where you would say, okay, maybe um, this young people are right, or maybe what these people are saying are right, and you sort of like reflect? Do you ever? Get oh, to I that do point? that a lot. I do that with even my children. Mm -hmm. If my children, for one reason or the other, and my children are very good at that, they will sit down and say, Mommy, we need to talk about this. And I'll sit there and I'll reflect. And if I have really done something wrong for to my children, I really apologize. These are human beings, mm -hmm. and they are intelligent. I've sent, them, I've, sent them to, I've sent them to school mm -hmm. so that they can be independent thinkers. Right. I mean, in this country, we have got a lot of educated people, and, we lo and it doesn't need, you don't need to be educated to know how to relate with other people. Mm -hmm. You know, in my job as a politician, I deal with people in the rural areas, and I learn a lot from them. I learn so much. What has kept me going up to where I am today is because I listen. I listen a lot. So and how do you translate that in your capacity as the Minister of Information, as a politician, as a leader, as a, the one who runs the, the media in the country? And what is being a leader? A leader is listening to people. 
If you remember very well, our president, when he got into power, and he continues to say that as leaders, you are servants of the people. Right. It's about listening to what the people are saying. If you are a leader and you are a politician, you don't listen to people, then you'll never be voted into power. It's very critical to listen to people. Yes, you have to be able to identify constructive criticism or where things are being said by detractors, right. which will not continue to make you go forward. Like I said, as I'm sitting here in this job as the Minister of Information, there is a lot which is said by me, and there's a lot I listen, and there's a, there's a lot I take to improve myself so that I, I become a better leader. Right. Yes. And we spoke earlier on, you spoke about your journey as a politician and, yes. and um, your role in the liberation struggle. Mm -hmm. Would you say that right now, and I know that the Zimbabwe Gender Commission has been really big on this, talking about how women are very low, there's very low activity as far as women participation is um, in Zimbabwe. Would you say that um, the current political landscape is favorable for women to actually participate in politics? Let me say it's not favorable 100%. Okay. It takes a lot to get to that 100%. Where are we but now? we are very grateful that we've got our own constitution, which was people driven, where people actually spoke about women empowerment issues. And I'm very happy because I was actually co chair of that 25 member parliament, members of parliament right. who, who were steering the. A constitution making process and I must say I saw the people of this country we went on an outreach where people even traditional leaders where they spoke about the importance of women empowerment this is why we came up with a constitution which was endorsed in 2013 right. which is a beautiful document for the women in this country it speaks to gender equality it speaks to 50 50 what it takes now what is in the constitution, what is important is implementation. Right. We need to work hard as women, and this is why I have been working very hard. I have not been watching from the terraces. I was the chairperson of the Women Parliamentary Caucus in Parliament, which is a position I was elected to by women from both political parties, MDC, ZANU, PF. And in that position, I worked with women to make sure that they are heard. Because when we talk of women empowerment, right. we just don't want to dress chairs or whatever. We want women to get into those decision-making positions and be able to implement and carry out. And women have got a lot of capacity. It's about building that confidence. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have been doing. And how do you build confidence of women? Is to make sure that those few women who go up there, mm -hmm. they continue to pull other women with them so that you are many. You can't be able to convince a table of only men. You it's need more hard. women on the table but to be able to push for women right. issues. And I, I think we have done okay as a country, but there's a lot more which needs to be done. First of all, we are talking about a constitution which is talking about 50-50 in all institutions of government. Right. Even in private sector, we are also talking in boards, we need women in there. And we are saying, as women, we need to respect each other, we need to work united, we need to be able to pull each other, mentor other young women. It's important even in politics that we bring young women on board so that as we move we can have somebody to leave our legacy with. But Mr. Mchanga, when women hear about other young politicians, for example, Joanna Mamombe and Cecilia Chinembili of the opposition party, when they are in and out of prison for one reason or the other, do you not think that this derails what you're trying to build or encouraging women to actually be in the forefront of politics? Being a politician doesn't mean you're above the law. This is one thing which is very clear. You are a politician, you are the laws of the country apply to each and every one in the in a country. So that's different from what you're saying. What I am talking about is for women of this country to know that when we are asking for women empowerment in this country, it's not asking for charity. The women in this country end it. We talked about Bianyanda. I talked about that generation like myself who went and fought for the struggle. Right. That war, the liberation struggle, we had no special kitchen for women had no special training for women. The training was tough, it was a war. If women are not trained equally strong, they will die in the battle. So I'm talking about what, where we have come from. And as young women, it is very important to emulate where the women of this country have come from, mm -hmm. starting from the time of Mbuyananda. So I'm saying to the girls out there, right. don't look back. 
the situation is, it may be look gloom, what do you call it? It may look like it's not possible. Gloom. gloom. Mm -hmm. It's not. It may look tough. It's not. And it's true. Women can be also tough leaders if it requires mm -hmm. a human being to be tough to carry out a certain, a certain uh, responsibility, then women can actually do it. We can't be let down by doomsayers who says women's place is in the kitchen. I do both. I, t I tell you, I'm, I think I've done well as a mother. My child, the last born, is doing his master's now, you know. And I'm saying to myself, in terms of, I just need to put where other people put 50% or 100%, maybe I have to put 150%. But it can so be can done. So acknowledge that women need to go the extra mile? They do. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, yes. This is why we talk, we talk about affirmative action. That's why we came up with a quota in the Constitution. Because the field has not been leveled. So we need that affirmative action to bring up those women to the same levels. And when we talk of women empowerment, let the men not be scared. We are not talking about displacing men on the table. We are saying, let's bring men on the table. And let me tell you this. Women empowerment issues are not human rights issues only. We are talking about developmental issues. It's known that countries which have developed in this world are led by women. There are more women in decision-making yeah, positions. Well and they've been doing response. very well mm -hmm. in COVID response. Talk about COVID response. Mm -hmm. The Interministerial Task Force on COVID-19 response is led by a woman, Ma Ma uh, Minister uh, Opa Mchinguri Kashiri. It, uh, the, the, even the coordinator, the national coordinator, of uh, COVID-19 response nationally is led by a woman, Dr. Agnes Pavomba. And here we are, we are leading the information sector to make sure that all Zimbabweans are aware of the precautionary right. and preventative measures of this pandemic so COVID-19. we speak about the work that the current government has done in mm. terms of uh, pushing for women empowerment. Mm. Maybe as you work closely with uh, President Emerson Mnangawa mm. in, in, the, in this admi administration, mm. maybe explain to us or enlighten us just how much and to what extent he's willing to uh, go and push for women empowerment and have women in, in leadership positions? Uh, let me say, first of all, the women didn't perform so well on the 210 constituencies in this country. Why uh, do you think uh, that? Uh, and that is, again, it's a question of empowerment. I mean, to run as a politician requires money. And uh, traditionally, men are the ones who uh, own uh, some kinds of means of production and also some businesses. And so we still want women to be helped in terms of making sure that they also participate in the primary elections, in the main elections themselves, because we, we still see that a lot of... And we still want to encourage women to vote for another women. We are working hard to make sure women also realize that uh, there's nothing wrong in uplifting a woman to lead you. It does, it's not a sign of weakness because you see, and I'm also saying to the young women out there, there's nothing wrong in standing up and saying I can do it. If it is about volunteering, whether it's in church, whether it's in, in, in clubs, whether it's whatever, wherever you are, to stand up and say, yes, I can do it. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. It starts from there. And we have also uh, taken on board the, the UN Women's uh, Solidarity Campaign for He For She, where we are saying now, Women have been talking about women empowerment issues from the day of Beijing. And that far, we are saying we need men to be talking about the benefits of going? women empowerment. How's that going? It is going very well because we see our president is a he for she campaign. I mean, I was talking about how he used his executive powers to bring the number of cabinet ministers to 30% in cabinet when in actual on the field, the women were very few. And in, in parliament, the women are very few. And look at how he managed to bring 50% when it came to provincial ministers of state, which, which shows that our president is mm -hmm. very much uh, a pro-gender equality. And uh, we are happy that even our boards, in our parastatals, mm -hmm. and he continues to encourage even private sector to make sure that there's women, uh, there's gender uh, equality in, in our institutions. So we, are, we, we have everything right, all what we need, we need the confidence, we need to continue working together as women, united, let's learn from each other. Right. Nobody knows it all. There is nobody which inspires me most like a woman.
on a, at much, all levels. On a much lighter note, Mr. Yes. Mchangwa, mm. um, I, I would want, allow me to say that yes. your fashion stands out. Like when you show up, you show out, you know. And I just wanted to find out from you, is it deliberate? Because you know that women are often judged. I mean, studies have shown that women are often judged by what they wear, their appearance. Mm. Is, is your appearance deliberate? Look, uh, when you walked the path I walked, uh, I started off as the first pioneer diplomats of this country. Mm. Uh, for Zimbabwe to start having diplomats, we were w one of the first ones. I was in the center of uh, Europe, a center of fashion in Brussels. I had an opportunity to learn a lot from Paris, from uh, Brussels itself, Italy. And uh, yes, impressions which people make when they see somebody are very important. Mm -hmm. I also had an opportunity to be educated in universities where you wouldn't graduate without talking publicly. You had to, public speaking was uh, part of the... So you had to look the parts. You have to look well, you have to present yourself, you have to speak well. Right. I, I remember very well, it wasn't easy. You would go in a hall full of 1,000 people, students, and then you address them on a topic. So you, for me, the key to be able to have confidence in whatever you're talking about is to know your subject. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what you want to talk about, then that becomes a problem. But if you know your subject, so it requires to understand whatever you want to talk about. If it's uh, that subject, once it's there, you'll be able to talk to about it. And well, I also, as I said, I, I, I'm the eighth born in, the, in a family of nine. My sisters, uh, you know, they were both in the, uh, who, were, who were older than me. They, they dressed up well. I think this is but something so I started, yeah, I took it from, yeah. So as we wrap up, Minister Muchangwa, mm -hmm. uh, I know that you already took your first shot of the COVID-19 vaccine, the sign from vaccine. I've done that. Yes, and yeah. when are you due for the second shot? On the fifth. Are you experiencing any side effects? Nothing. Absolutely, I feel so good from the time I had that vaccination. Nothing, no reaction. And uh, I'm feeling so good and I'm ready for the second dose. You do realize that there are still uh, people that are skeptical about the vaccines and are reluctant to take the vaccine. Lisa, mm. Lisa, this is about life or death. We saw the upset you had in December, January in this country. We saw the tragedy. At one point, we had to bury five uh, heroes, national heroes, in one week. We lost, for me, I started off announcing statistics. Then it came to my friends, my colleagues in the in cabinet. Then it came even to my family. I lost my own brother. Uh, my, my brother, who I come after, uh, succumbed to this uh, COVID-19. So COVID-19 is real. And we should be grateful as a country that we have got a president who ran around. First, he didn't take time to, uh, to set up an intermediate task force to make sure that we up our response to COVID-19, make sure our hospitals are in a position where they can treat what needed to be done in terms of PPEs, all that training of our health workers. And when the vaccination uh, came, he didn't take time, he ran around. Zimbabwe is one of the first African countries to receive vaccination. And since the rollout uh, is there, it's also free. It's not, uh, you don't pay to be vaccinated. So we are talking here as a Ministry of Information to the people of this country to say, it's a question of life and death. We don't know, they're talking about the third wave. We don't know whether it's going to come into our country. And we are saying, we need our economies to, to go back to normal. This is, has been very difficult. Is the way to go? Vaccination is the way to go. If we can, at least vaccinate 10 million people in our country, then we can attain the herd immunity. Then that way we would have uh, really contained the spread of this COVID-19. Mm -hmm. It is very important. And the, the, the vaccine which are, which are being administered in our country are very, very safe. And we, we look forward to all the other countries. Some people think, oh, these are Chinese, or there's exactly. this, there's this. I, I must tell you that the Chinese have been in the business of medicine for a very long time. And I speak from experience. Right. Yeah. Uh, is there any chance that uh, there's been talk around, oh, the government is going to make vaccination compulsory? Are you going to go that route? Well, I, uh, we have to vaccinate what, 10 million people. There will come a time and already there are some airlines who are already demanding that if you don't have a COVID vaccination card, you will not board their aeroplane. 
there will come a time when the shops are going to say you cannot come into the supermarket if you don't have your COVID vaccination. And this is done to protect yourself and those who are around you. So it's, it's very important for us to think seriously. The benefits are clearly there. There is no after, uh, after effects. And in any case, this is not the first time Zimbabwe has rolled out vaccines. You know, we rush with our babies for BCG vaccinations. We do these vaccinations for polio, for measles, mumps. All those are but vaccinations. So, would be minister, those vaccinations took a while to actually develop and compared to the COVID-19 vaccine. Well, that's another conversation for another day. Well, for, well I don't know. This is a continuation of uh, studies of vaccinations, especially in China. There's been SARS. Cov two and all that. So the study has been going on. Yeah. I, I really have have not had any countries because this sign of a farm vaccine and sign of our has not just been administered in Zimbabwe. Sometimes we speak like this is a vaccine which has just come into this country. It has gone to so many countries like Brazil, uh, Indonesia, and some countries in Europe. Uh, the, the, this vaccine and we haven't had any problems of coming out of those who have been vaccinated. So what we have seen are the benefits. And this is what we're saying as Zimbabweans, we should look at the benefits. We are lucky to have those vaccines in the country. Let's take it up ourselves to go and get vaccinated. Lastly, Minister Mutranga, what would you like to be remembered for? What would you say you would want your legacy to be about? My legacy is to work hard for the women folk of this country so that nobody would ever look down on women because as women, we can break the ice. We can break the glass ceiling. We can do it. We need to challenge each other. We need to listen to each other. We need to mentor each other. We need to move together. I love my country. I'm doing all what I'm doing because I love people. I love my country. I demonstrated it from the age of 14. And this is precisely why I am continuing working hard for the people of this country until we all get opportunities, which is what was the reason for the liberation struggle. Minister Monica Mchanga, appreciate your time with us today. Thank you.